Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, thank you very much for joining us today at this first ever Digital Technologies Conference in our community. First of all, I want to thank Clemens and Alpen Libraries, Instructional Technology and Academic Affairs, whose generous support made this conference possible. I would also like to give special thanks to the Digital Humanities Research Institute at the City University of New York, whose guidance has been invaluable and indispensable. The planning of this conference is an amazing experience of collaboration, teamwork, and dedication. Please give a round of applause to all the presenters who have spent many hours to bring us their exciting work on digital tasks. Additionally, my special thanks to Miranda Novak, Kathy Park, Kathy Robeck, John Meyerhofer, Carol Brash, and Derek Larson. It has been an absolute pleasure and honor to work with them. I hope today's opportunity of learning and sharing will open new doors and motivate us to explore the great options and potentials of digital technologies in our teaching and research. Also, I hope today's discussions and reflections will lead to more innovation and explorations and creative applications of digital tech in our classrooms and on our campuses. Thank you. So when we start the conference, we kind of have to start with a question of what are digital technologies? Well, there is the official definition. So that magic number, you know, of one or zero. But in reality, we work digital technologies every day all the time, you know, they are really ubiquitous. And today, we will really focus on how to make digital technologies a positive force and a creati creative force in our lives, in our teaching and research, and also in our students' lives. So that will be the focus of the talk today. There are some really good examples of what people are doing on and off campuses, and we will have the opportunity throughout the day to see them. Um, so for me, when I was doing teaching, I came across a really beautifully professional-made website. When I want to find you know, Holocaust or genocide, Testimonies, this is the place for me to go. There's so many resources embedded <coughs> in the website. This is professional made, but this is not that much beyond what we could do as you know, a team of educators. So this started really small, but has grown over the years, have all these uh, resources for teachers all through the world. And another resource for people who really wanted to learn digital technologies in terms of the skills and the foundations will be the Digital Humanities Research Institute at the City University of New York. I was very fortunate uh, last summer to have a training institute at uh, um, <coughs> this university last year. And today we'll have a flavor of it. When we talk about from here, we know what are the technologies, how we are using them in our classrooms, and the next step will be really to gain more tech skills, and this is, the, you know, this is one of the best places to go. And today we'll you know, touch on the curriculum of it uh, when we're learning Python for humanities. I want to 
to show you a couple of works from our students. This is really the best part, how we use them in the classroom. So this is a video made by students from the Chinese mythology class. Hello, my name is Olivia Newgard and I am a senior biology major at College of St. Benedict. This is the story of Neon and how the traditions of the Chinese New Year came to be. Long, long ago in the Chinese mountains, there was a small, peaceful village filled with happy families. Just outside the village, there lived a horrible demon monster named Neon. Neon, a horrible looking creature, resembled a flat faced lion with a dog's body and prominent sharp teeth. He was larger than an elephant and had two long horns. Every year, on the first day of the year, Nian would arise and descend upon the villagers, eating and destroying everything in his path, including the small children. Fearing the demon creature, the villagers would escape to a remote region of the mountain for safety on the first of each year. One New Year's Eve, when all of the villagers were preparing to leave for refuge on the mountain, a strange old man arrived in the village. An old beggar with silver hair, most villagers paid him no attention as they packed in chaos. An elder woman from the village came to greet the man and shared some food. She shared their worry about Neon and tried to persuade the old man to come with them, but he refused and stayed behind alone in the old woman's house. Around midnight, as the beast began to tear through the village, he noticed a house with lights on. As he approached, he saw doors and windows pasted with red papers and candles lit throughout the home. Nian began to feel afraid and tremble. The old man began to light bamboo, causing a cracking sound, and made lots and lots of noise startling Nian. Shaking in fear, he retreated and ran away from the village. When the villagers returned the next morning, they were amazed to see their village unharmed. They learned from the old man, who was really a godsend to protect them, that Neon was afraid of the color red and loud noises. Today, Chinese citizens pace their houses in red, wear red clothing, and light fireworks on Chinese New Year's Day. It is referred to as Guo Neon, meaning surviving the Neon. Buddhism and Taoism have their own unique New Year's traditions. However, the Chinese New Year tradition has been around for thousands of years since before the religions ever came to be practiced. Ancient Egyptians celebrated the New Year at the annual flooding of the Nile, which was linked to agricultural and astronomical events. Phoenicians and Persians began their New Year with the spring equinox. The Greeks celebrated it at the beginning of the winter solstice. 4,000 years ago, the Babylonians began to celebrate New Year's at the first new moon following the vernal equinox, which they believed represented the rebirth of the natural world. Similar to the Babylonians, the Romans also celebrated according to the vernal equinox. Romulus, the founder of Rome, created a calendar, but it quickly fell out of sync with the sun. This led Julius Caesar to commission a new calendar, which eventually led to the Gregorian calendar that is still used today. While there have been many traditions that have come and gone over the past thousands of years, and although many modern countries have adapted to celebrate the New Year according to the Gregorian calendar, the Chinese still celebrate the New Year on the first day of the second moon after the winter solstice. So this is a project made by one student, but we also do a lot of teamwork. The students, they cannot really produce this without the support of our wonderful staff with the instructional technology. Uh, I remember it was, you know, um, you know, our staff member go to the class, show them, and it's how amazing they can learn them so fast and produce beautiful product. And these are really, really, you know, top 5% on the, the YouTube um, that made on Chinese cultures.
Our names are Carly Seamers and Sophia Woods, and we are students at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. The Chinese myth we are presenting to you is the story of the Monkey King and Jiwang Mu's Peaches of Immortality. In the distant past, a monkey was born that... So this is the teamwork. By, you see the point. Digital technologies, they really open doors for us and for our students. And you see how they can you know, connect different cultures and really bring the treasures from the world to our community. And that's the beauty of it. So next, I want to, you know, we will have um, faculty and staff to show how they worked with digital tech and how that benefited our students. So Henry, would you like to come? Sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have my own online digital biochemistry text that I created about 20 years ago. I want to talk a little bit about our experiences in chemistry and using online educational resources and uh, a lot about my own experience. So this is a long time ago. I started off not trying to do this. What happened is I really draw poorly and so I would create uh, PowerPoint illustrations. And then I'd end up putting them on the web in the old days. And then I'd put a caption underneath. And I said, well, it needed more explanation. So I would put a, more of an explanation. Then one day I had to compile so much, I talked to Tom Cree. He said, why don't you just turn it into a book and use it in your class? So that was over 20 years ago, and I did. Uh, this is before they had good web editors. <laughs> there was a lot of typos in it. Uh, but that's one of the reasons, essentially, I started doing this, is because I felt like I wanted to create a book that actually worked with the way I taught. Uh, so it sort of just happened, but eventually it came out to be a pretty large book. The way I look at it, all teaching is local. If you buy a textbook, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the content, that's the organization that you want to use. So for my goal was basically to create something that fit exactly the way I wanted to teach. Uh, and I was always a little really worried about the escalating cost of STEM textbooks. I mean, they're incredibly expensive. And finally, I wanted to create a book that we could share with others that people any place could use. So I just put it freely on the web, and that had some really cool outcomes. So I'm just going to walk through just briefly. This is my book, uh, and it'll go to the web. Uh, and it's just organized like any other book. It has chapters, and it has embedded questions in it. And it has interactive stuff, which I'm going to show. Uh, so it, on the surface, it looks like pretty much any book that you would pick up uh, any place on the web. Uh, what happened about six years ago is a guy at UC Davis, Delmar Larson, uh, decided he wanted to create STEM books free for anybody in the world, any place. So he talked to me and asked me if he, I could upload my material to his site. Uh, and so I did, because my goal was not to make money. My goal was to just disseminate the book to anyone that wanted to use it. In part, it came from all my time in China, because I, I, back when I first went to China, the resources simply weren't there uh, to, to, and for, for instance, biochemistry uh, to teach the stuff that was really modern. So I wanted to basically distribute it so it would be used around the world. So in fact, this is the, the hits. So just for the table of contents page on my online book since January, and you can see that it's used all over the world. Now, I don't know exactly how it's used. They might have clicked on it and said, I don't want to use it. But essentially, it's got widespread uh, uh, access and utility across the world. So I upload. So since I started putting this book online, uh, my table of contents page has got about 430,000 hits. When I put it at UC Davis in the Bio Libre text, uh, within a couple of years it went up to a, a million. So overall, by 2017, I had uh, over 1.5 million hits on it. I'm sure it's more than that. Uh, so in terms of utility and use, it's widely used. Uh, this is a graph that uh, I got from Delmar uh, in UC Davis that talked about the core consumer price index and the price for textbooks. Uh, and certainly they have grown astronomically. And again, that was one of the reasons I want to put a book online. 
Uh, but partly it was really fun to create this. Uh, and so I created a little video for NSF that I, that I uh, gave them once, and this comes from this. So to me, online tests were like magic. It's like looking at Harry Potter, and looking at the newspapers, and the figures would just pop out, uh, rotate, talk to you. So in fact, partly my book is really interactive. So uh, let's see, if we, that's not what I wanted to do. So yeah. So I have interactive images based on data that's just really available uh, uh, protein structures. This is a cell computer. So the students have uh, basically uh, there's like 80 of these rotating models, and this is kind of slow, in which you can actually change the rendering of molecules. Uh, and for instance, this is an example of DNA uh, that's wound around a bunch of proteins. That, uh, and you can, the students can click this and change the rendering. That looks like really horrible in terms of color, but if I actually uh, change the orientation around here, I think you could see This is not responding very quickly here. I have to move it slowly. I think you could start seeing the DNA. Whoops. You can see the, the, the DNA helix here, and the red are protein sort of embedded in the middle. But so I'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, so it's partly the interactivity that which is really important to have in a digital resource. Uh, I wanted to make it as interactive as possible so the students would actually get something out of it, not read a passive text. So in terms of mathematical analysis, biochem has a lot of it, and really students are less and less mathematically sophisticated. So uh, when we talk about reactions in chemistry, we can represent them symbolically, we can use mathematics to describe them, and we can uh, show them graphically. But frankly, this is a simple reaction in which slight uh, some reactant A goes to a, a product B, then goes on to a product C. Think of it as like a Democrat going to a Republican going to a Libertarian. <laughs> Three different species of individuals. Right? And you can describe this mathematically and then present static graphs. But what I wanted to do is make, whoops, see? Let's go back here. I wanted to make graphs that were actually interactive, so let's start off from here again. Okay, from current slide, there we go. So this, this actually goes to uh, one of the chapters in my books, and here's the equations, and here's the graph. But I'm actually able to embed in the book uh, graphs that are interactive. <coughs> so the students can say, okay, how fast does A go to B goes to C? You can start changing some of the constants that describe it, and look at, for instance, at the behavior of the graph. So, if let's say the Democrat goes to Republican really, really quickly, okay, you can see that the outcome of the graph changes. So this is potentially brings the mathematics more to a maybe an intuitive level for the students to understand. Uh, so I think in terms of digital resources, this is the kind of thing that you can do digitally that you can't do in other, with other media. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do was create a, a book that I could update immediately and any time I wanted to. And folks, so I'm sure you've heard of CRISPR-Cas9. It's a gene editing system. Uh, I was able to put in a chapter in my book on that. I'm sure before any biochem textbook in the whole country had it. Uh, so now that's both good and bad. It's good because I can do it and when I want to. It's bad because I feel like it's really difficult to update things all the time. To have a textbook that you feel like you have to update, it's nice when the new edition comes out and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so we also have the ability, there's so much big data out there uh, in terms of structures and you know, how, how things are related to each other in terms of a molecular structure that the students now can use online programs to process the data. So I have that also embedded in the book. Uh, so it makes it quite easy to use. So again, it's a like traditional book with traditional chapters, and uh, essentially it's as easy for students to use as any other book. 
So this book is now part of the Libra project, the Libra text project. Delmar Larson just got $4.9 million to work with a consortium of people, including us at St. Ben's and St. John's, uh, to create books for chemistry, for every single chemistry course in the entire four-year curriculum. Uh, and it will be absolutely free. Uh, his site is really powerful since they started up with the Chem Libra text in 2008. It's had over 283 million hits. Uh, we got part of that 4.9 million. Uh, unfortunately, a very tiny fraction of it. <laughs> but uh, I am rewriting my online textbook, uh, a project that's called Text Mappy. You look at a traditional biochem book in terms of structure organization, which most people in the world would seem to want, and then I write it in my own voice. Uh, so it follows the traditional organization that everybody uses. Uh, and then uh, it's a two-year project for me, uh, and it will keep me going even after I retire. Chris Schaller likewise got money uh, to do a online inorganic test in, in text, and Kate Graham has as well. Uh, you know, our students are different than they used to be uh, in terms of their resources. If you look, it was a 2013 report called Turning the Page. 30% of the students don't buy textbooks. Now, is that true here? Does anybody have a sense of that? I, mean, I, I would have no idea. And then they said of the, of the one-third who do, uh, only one-third buy new books. So the book market is changing, the resources are changing, and there's an infinite amount of material out there on the web. The idea is to allow the students and set up an infrastructure so that students know what is good. And by providing it, uh, I mean, that's the best of both worlds. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer really quickly. I probably went over my 10 minutes, but it's really tough to keep this up. I mean, update it all the time. It really is. But it's really gratifying when people use it. Yeah. <coughs> How difficult is it to learn the, to the initial creating of the book? Uh, not so much now because I do everything, well, we don't have a really great web editor here. We have web expressions, which uh, Microsoft made and no longer supports, uh, which is unfortunate. But I've been using that for years. I started just doing my own stuff, but when that came along, it was pretty easy. Uh, basically, it's just cut and paste these days. I mean, some of these fancy programs to interdigitate, you know, interactive graphs and molecular models, I struggled with and I still do because the technology constantly changes for that too. So like I feel like now I want to learn some more computer coding, you know, I just don't have a background. But I can cut and paste really well and it looks like I know what I'm doing, but <laughs> we'll keep it in this room. <laughs> I don't, but it looks pretty impressive when you see those rotating molecules. So keeping up with the software has been a challenge for me, but at the same time it's gotten easier. Yeah. Uh, do you get any feedback from students as far as they like this? Uh, I do, I do. Uh, when I first started it, they hated it in, in part because there were so many typos. I, I cannot proofread at all. That eventually uh, got fixed when proofreading came along. Uh, it, I, they really like it, but many still want a text because they want that hard flavored book. Uh, I taught a, a teach a course in signal transduction. Uh, I didn't have a text, I just used online papers and my online stuff, and they still wanted a text. So um, now for that particular course, I use a text that they can buy and just for three months from uh, Amazon, you know? Uh, but in general, I think, you know, you read about students being computer savvy, but I, I don't know if I buy it, to tell you the truth. But it seems to me that these, uh, these kinds of resources are inexorably moving in the direction that everything will be on the web at some point. And again, for me, the, the widespread use of this around the world is most, the most gratifying thing. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, we, I'm Tina Strike from the bookstore, and I'm Crystal Lindstrand. I'm a course materials buyer, so I'm the one that you send all your textbook information to. And we're going to just tell you today what our digital strategy is for course materials and the services we can provide you. So. The objectives for today is we'll just review what we already have, currently have options for digital technology and how to submit your adoptions for digital or alternative sources that you're using. And then lastly, how do we communicate this to students and how can we support you in that communication so students know what they're using? Um, so we, 
one of the first options we have is obviously an ebook. Um, an ebook is obviously just an electronic copy of a physical textbook. Um, the bookstore uses a company called Red Shelf for all of our ebooks. Um, so they facilitate, and we can go on there and sell the students a code. They go on to Red Shelf and they can get all of their digital books on there. And most of the time, it is a less expensive option for the students. Um, one other way that we provide some digital content is through access codes through a publisher. So if you work, if your textbook is mainly through McGraw Hill, their uh, access or their integrated learning systems are called Connect, um, and a lot of times that has the ebook plus homework platforms for you to use. Um, and we can either facilitate it directly through the publisher, they'll sell just a piece of paper that we sell to the students, or we can do it right through Red Shelf so that it's completely digital. Um, the other, another option we have is direct access. This is new, pretty new to our campus. If you see publisher reps, they may call it inclusive access. Um, here on campus, we call it direct access. So how this works is um, students receive their digital content directly through Canvas. So Kathy helps set up on all the courses that use it, uh, a tool that students access. Students um, have the option to opt out of that material if they don't want it. And anybody who does not opt out after the 10th day, their student account automatically gets charged. So publishers do some deep, deep discounting for direct access because it's all digital and it is 100% sell through in their eyes for the most part, most students. Um, Buy it. So we've done some big departments so like accounting and biology is going to go to direct access. And the other thing is they can buy a loose leaf paperback option for a very inexpensive than the national version. So this is most suited for big courses or really expensive textbooks. Um, that's the best use of direct access. Um. Some of the other, the, we have had some adoptions where it's an online only uh, digital platform. And some examples of these are StuKent or Flatworld that I've gotten adoptions for. Um, so they typically want to sell directly to the student. And so they provide the faculty member a link to send their students online to purchase. Um, the problem with this is, is that students lose the option to use their tuition accounts. And we are finding more and more students don't have the money on their own to just use a credit card and pay. So this provide, for example, Flat World will sell directly to the bookstore an access code that costs exactly the same if you send your students online. So this. The, the student is, can buy it through the bookstore, use their tuition account, or buy it online, and they pay the same price. So even though they tell you, send your students directly online, if you let us know, we can a lot of times work with them and sell to the students so that they can use their tuition accounts. Um, one other option, and I think you'll hear more about this, is OERs. So they're open educational resources. Most of the time, they're free books online. Um, intro courses are the most popular that use them, but um, there are others that do. And uh, for example, one of the most popular ones that we have on campus is OpenStax. And we provide, um, for OpenStax titles, we are able to provide a printed version that is very inexpensive for the students, for those that want it. So when you're submitting adoptions, you know, please just tell us everything you're going to use so that we can do the research and find out if there is an option to help provide it through the bookstore because we know students want to use that tuition account. Um, it also helps with student accessibility. So we work with that student accessibility office and give them our book list so that they, can ha they know what material students are needing for students that they are Use it, that are using their services. And really, the beginning of August, now coming up, we will put our book list online, and we are the first stop for students to learn about their course materials 
We make it really easy. They click links at the bottom of their schedule. It populates their list. So we can help with communicating a lot of what you're using just by letting us know. Um, so how do you submit adoptions? You can email Krista. There's an online form. Call or stop in the bookstore. Um, they're due October 1st for spring semester, April 1st for fall. And then really if you're using a paperback book, if you get them in before buyback, that's really important so we can buy back those books and recycle them on campus. And then when we're communicating digital or alternative books to students, really your role would be to send out an email to students to let them know. But then we also, as I said before, we put it on our website. We have lots of notes on our websites and we're gonna show you what they look like so you can see if you're providing a print option or a digital option to students what that might look like for students to know what they, what they need to purchase. So. so the first one here is um, they, were, they were using both, um, well they were using the big Java textbook, however the ebook was a less expensive version and so they wanted them the option to choose. So I always put a note <coughs> on there that says you need to choose one or the other and it really is just giving the student that option. So it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. They just choose one of, one of the two. And the price difference is pretty substantial for the e-book and the, the loose leaf even, it's not a bone book. Um, this one, um, I was notified from the library that this book was available for free through the library using a link. Um, and so what we do is we change it, the paper copy to recommended versus required. And then we put a note that it's free through the library and that whenever you are using a resource like that through the library, the library will provide you a link and you should provide the link to your students so that every time the student clicks on it, the library can keep track of how often it is being used. Because when they check it, they're going to see, yeah, this was used several times this semester. That's going to make it so that it's still available next time. If they don't see that it's being used, they may say, oh, we don't need this anymore. Um, if, you're, if they are using a direct access um, course material, we don't have any pricing in there because we don't have anything for them to physically purchase from us because everything is provided through Canvas and they automatically get charged. So all of their information is here in the note. They also get several emails from us directly from if they're enrolled in that class. They get emails saying you need to opt out if you don't want to use the materials um, and all of that extra information they get directly in an email. But this will tell them how much they can expect to be charged for that material. Um, if it's a publisher direct one and we can't provide this, um, we will tell them that. That this is something that we can't provide and that the instructor will give them the information. But then that way they're not surprised when they go to class and go, I thought there wasn't any book for this class, and now you have to buy something. So it's just a way for us to communicate with them. Um, in OER, for example, our physics courses do use um, the OER. So I provide the link for the, the free textbook right in there. Um, but the paper option is available, and we put it as optional. So that they know that they don't, they're not required to purchase it, but it's there if they want it. And thank you all for your partnership. I think together, working together, we can make textbooks and course materials more affordable and accessible for our students. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So if, uh, I just want to make sure I, I understand this correctly. So if we're using things that won't be sold through you, but maybe are available via Canvas, um, if it's something that we've written ourselves, but it's sort of in a PDF form, or if it's um, oh, one of the library electronic books, we should still submit those to you? Yes, okay. because we still get requests from students 
Do you have a paper copy of this? It, I, know it, I know it sounds crazy, but they do. They come in and they say, I need this book. And I say, I didn't know you needed that book. I can order it, but then it usually, usually takes them longer. But if I know about it ahead of time, I can be prepared for that. Um, not everybody comes in, but there are still always some that do. Yeah. Excuse me. If you provide a, an online PDF, uh, you post it, and it's freely available to the students, and they want to have it printed. What's the options for the students? Does that come out of their pocket, or? Yeah, it depends. Really, you you'd have to read the copyright on it pretty carefully. So, if they print a PDF. Typically, like even an ebook, there's a certain percentage, or a lot of times they can print an entire ebook. But if you were to want something printed and us to sell it to students, we have to get 100% copyright on it for resale. So, how you guys use copyright is a little different for academics than for us in the bookstore, but I think there's some great library resources out there for, to help kind of get, get through that. But if it's a short PDF, I would guess students would just print it on their own. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm gonna go in a little bit of a different direction. I'm Carlin Forner, I work in the Academic Affairs Office. Um, but I'm gonna to talk to you today about something called the SNCC Digital Gateway, which in my previous job before here, I was the project manager for the SNCC Digital Gateway project. Um, and then I'm a continuing collaborator because it's something that, that is still going on today. So th this website um, is a collaborative project between the SNCC Legacy Project, and SNCC stands for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, which was kind of the organization of young people who were organizing during the 1960s civil rights movement. And so these are folks who are in their 70s and early 80s today um, and are really interested in preserving their history and passing on their knowledge to the next generation of young people and young activists who are organizing today. So a collaboration between the SNCC Legacy Project and then Duke University Libraries and the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. Um, and so this came together when the SNCC veterans wanted to tell a different version of the civil rights movement than has typically been told. Because the standard story is that Rosa Parks sat down, Martin Luther King stood up, the white kids came down, saved the day, justice rolled down like water. You know, that's kind of the, the story that gets told about the movement. And that is not the SNCC veterans' experience at all. They were folks who um, started really with the student sit-ins in 1960, moved into the Freedom Rides, moved into voter registration, work in the Deep South, um, and then from voter registration work started doing independent political party organizing, created the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, what you'd know as the Black Panther Party in Lowndes County, and was also doing a lot of economic um, empowerment and organizing. And all of their work they were doing with local people on the ground. It was about creating change um, in people's lives, you know, go, going to, to these rural communities and working with folks and saying, what do you need? What would make your life better? How can we help you? Um, so it was all about local people, you know, people who don't make it into history books, and all about these young organizers who, you know, set out to change the world in a whole variety of ways. So they wanted to tell their story, um, and they've seen the history told so poorly that they wanted to be con in control of it. They wanted to tell the story from their perspective. Um, so the project really has a lot of components to it. Um, there's both the collaboration between activists and scholars and, and universities, which is not a very smooth relationship at all. There's been a lot of tension there over the years. Um, it's also a project about students producing content for the site. We, um, well, you know, not, not tied to these campuses, we worked with a bunch of students at Duke University um, who worked on producing the content for the site. They would actually write the first drafts and do all of the research using digital primary sources and other secondary sources, and then their drafts would go on to the SNCC veterans who would then read it over. And these folks, the SNCC veterans at this point have gone on to be like documentary film producers and they're journalists and you know they, they have, have gone on to do a lot of uh, kind of big cool things. And so the SNCC veterans would then go and read the drafts that the students wrote and then use those as a basis to kind of to, to make sure that the story was the actual SNCC veterans story. Um, and then that was the material that went on the website. 
And so how this all came together was that there was an editorial board that had SNCC veterans, scholars, and then library staff on it. And they were responsible for uh, coming up with the site <coughs> architecture of the site and deciding which content was on the site, how it was all going to be organized. Um, and then there was the, the project staff, which I was the project manager, and then had some other folks at, at the library. And then we had the student project team, which were charged with you know, bringing the site together. Um, and so one thing that was really important to the SNCC veterans was providing a lot of different access points to the history, which you can see um, down here on the bottom. So when people come to the site, you can come at the, the history through the people. Um, there's a timeline. Inside SNCC is like a section about sort of how the organizers organized um, and sort of the inner workings of SNCC as an organization. Um, and then a map. And let me just walk you through some of this so you can see see what this is. We ended up producing what was like an encyclopedia. We did not set out to do this, but there's like 500 pages of content on the site. Um, I should say this was also funded by a three-year Mellon grant. So this was not, we, we had funds going into this and we had funds to hire um, a, a web designer uh, to kind of come up with the, the design of the site. And then because we were based at Duke University Libraries, we also had uh, access to all of, the, all of the developers in the library, which helped fine tune. The project staff populated all the site and did all of the content work, but then we had developers who were helping us kind of make sure that we had the tools that we needed to tell the story. Um, so if you go to the people page, there, there is a list of, I don't have the count off the top of my head, but as you can see, it's a, it's a good number of folks that we have profiles on. And so when you click on one of these people, it'll eventually, hmm, not bring up that, <laughs> but this, um, what it is is a 500 to 700 word narrative um, about who was this person and why were they important to the movement. Um, it's kind of doing some weird rendering things right now, but on the side here, um, there are also embedded primary sources. Um, hmm, Internet Explorer is not, the, if you use a different browser, uh, <laughs> this will look smoother and I'm gonna go back and work on this. Um, <laughs> but there are embedded primary sources on the side uh, that link to different digitized documents from the movement. So you can actually dig in to some of these sources. Um, there, like I said, there are so many aspects of, of this site and this work that one of the things that the SNCC veterans wanted to do was that in the last decade or so, there have been amazing uh, digital primary source collections that have come online about the movement, um, like the Wisconsin Historical Society, Library of Congress, University of Southern Mississippi, have really robust uh, both document and oral history collections uh, that they've put online. But one of the problems is that unless you're a historian and you are ready to spend hours and hours and hours digging into this material, it's almost inaccessible to folks. You know, if you have 50,000 pages of documents, it's just too much for, for students, um, young activists to, to really engage in. So one thing that we were trying to do with the site is sort of give some context in the narrative, but then link folks to these different do document collections and these different primary sources so they could go and hear these people speak for themselves and read what they were writing in the 1960s. Um, so it's a sort of window into these larger collections. So let me just walk you through a few. Um, we have a timeline which is divided into five different sections up on top. Um, and these are all sections that the SNCC veterans, all of this, all of this the SNCC veterans signed off on. Uh, and we had hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of debate about what was the appropriate framing. Because for them, all of it really matters. You know, how you tell this history um, really matters and, and influences how people understand it. Um, and so for each of these uh, uh, timeline pages, they look very similar to the profile pages. Um, and that there's, there's the narrative about why the movement, why that particular moment in the movement mattered um, and connects you with sources. Uh, the inside SNCC section was especially <coughs> geared towards younger activists. Uh, so the SNCC veterans have, have very close relationships these days with um, folks who are organizing in the movement for black lives and like the Dream Defenders in Florida and BYP 100. So, you know, folks who are on the ground trying to organize today. And the SNCC folks want to pass on uh, 
you know, what they learned about their organizing so that people don't have to repeat the same mistakes. So the inside SNCC section was a way of talking about how the organizer, organizers organized. Um, and the national office, this is one of my favorite sections of the site because it has things, it has sections about the Sojourner motor fleet. Like they, SNCC maintained a fleet of cars that they, they had to let their staff use and had to keep track of and had, they had a mechanic on staff. You know, so they have that. They have a thing about fundraising, uh, the communications department, the photography department. You know, like, so how SNCC was actually organized and how they were going about their work. Um, so the inside SNCC section talks about that. And then two of the coolest sections is one of the Our Voices section. Um, and so over the course of the project, we actually brought a bunch of SNCC veterans to campus to have conversations with each other, um, to record their stories and experiences amongst friends, not you know historians asking questions, but SNCC veterans telling stories and interpreting their work with other SNCC folks. Um, and so we ended up creating a, a very large amount of of primary source material ourselves, which we weren't necessarily expecting, and all of this is now archived uh, at Duke University Libraries. But the Our Voices section features, you know, clips from these conversations, and so it's the movement veterans telling their story from their own perspective. And then one thing that came up at the very end of the project um, was. So how do we make this history relevant to, to folks who are organizing today? And then the Today section was a way to incorporate the voices of young activists that the SNCC veterans are currently partnering with. Um, and so as you can see, all these questions on the side, you know, what is the unfinished business you're trying to address? How do you control the narrative? How do you sustain yourself? And so these are different video clips that focus folks who or that that feature folks who are organizing today, um, but also are compilations with some of the movement veterans too. So it's movement veterans and young folks in in conversation with each other, uh, talking about how this history is relevant. Um, and so that's just sort of a brief overview of the website. And there are lots of there are really cool components of the project. You know, like collaborating between activists and scholars. We learned much in a very like long, painful, but rewarding process. Um, also the importance of working with students and what students can do because students wrote this whole thing. They were, we would not have been able to do this without the team of undergraduates and graduate students who are really committed to the work. Um, and, and they really took ownership of the project. So there, there's all of that. Um, and then on the flip side, we learned an awful lot about putting together a website like this and you know the pluses and minus of WordPress, of digital publishing, of embedding primary sources. Um, so there, it, was, it was a really robust project um, that, that gave us lots of insights into different <coughs> aspects of digital technology. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah. So when you go to the timeline, you click on those different movements, does it relate back to the people and vice versa when you go to the people, it tells you kind of what movements they're involved in? It's all interlinked okay. throughout the site. Yes, we Same spent a lot of time like linking okay. and all this, it's, it's not flashy, right? Amazon does this automatically, yeah. you know, with all the algorithms and that, but all of ours is, you know, hand linked throughout it. But yeah, it all ties back into okay. each other. All right, well, thank you. Oh, yeah. What's your current position? What, what do you do? <laughs> well, at, at this point, the project came to an end last May. So I'm an officially a member of the editorial board, but we just, uh, we just finished writing a planning grant um, for 18, uh, with the Mellon Foundation for another 18 months. So at this point, I'm kind of like a de facto unpaid project manager. Um, the thing, the SNCC veterans, they're in their 70s and 80s. We spent a long time developing good working relationships and they, they understand that time is, is not increasing for them and that now is the time to do it. So all of us who work on the project, uh, like on the editorial board or the advisory board, also understand that this has become not, not a lifelong commitment for us, but a, a lifelong commitment in terms of how long the SNCC veterans are around. And as long as they're still going, we are enlisted. So that's my role. Well, thanks everyone.